Reader, I married him. You got the job. Well done, Thank Lillian. You. I'm going to tell everyone else to leave. That We don't want them. You're, you're the one for this. Well done. Thanks. Oh, my God. You're welcome. I'm honored. <laughs> Do you want to be my Rochester? <laughs> yes, Jane. I will be your Rochester. <laughs> It was so good so fast. <laughs> Hello, Lillian. Hello, Piper. Hey, we're back. Air buds. We are back. Yay. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> we did a radio episode this week. We went back to the BBC yeah. and said, we don't have time to look at things and listen to things. We need to multitask. And BBC said, I got you. Here, yeah. have some audio. It's just the story, but you don't have to look at it. So you can do other things while you For listen. Sure. They're like, we're the, we're the BBC. We yeah. have top quality bird full. Uh, what's it called with the like sound effects? <laughs> Yeah, I just heard you say bird full and then you stopped and I was like, what's that? It's like fully, it's not foliage, but it's full, like, like fully work? the thing? Yes. Think, yeah. Yeah. Sound effects. The fully works great. The bird, <laughs> bird sounds top quality. The gravel BBC was sounds, like, we did this for you. The kissy sounds. It was all good. Kissy sounds were on the side of maybe too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to a certain scene, but anyway, okay. My point is, thank you, BBC, for helping us to enjoy Jane Eyre on the go. Yes. This is the go-gurt of Jane Eyre. This is the go-gurt of Jane Eyre! <laughs> Which maybe makes you think, ew, sounds bad. But spoiler alert, this is one of my favorites we've ever consumed. So. Oh, good. <laughs> Piper's always spoiling that she liked things. Hey, man, I don't want to keep people <laughs> waiting on, on bated breaths. They're like, but tell us what you thought. And I'm like, hey, it was good. I liked it. <laughs> But we did talk right before this. Um, we've been debating. And if you guys have opinions on this, please let us know mm -hmm. um, if we should bother doing recaps because um, they're all the same. Because as it turns out, it's the same story every time because we're always watching Jane Eyre. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to make sure that if maybe you haven't been paying as close of attention and you want to just like a quick little refresh on what Jane Eyre is, that you've got it here. Yeah. And that we can be there for you as your podcast experts. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a short, a quick one today for, re for real this time, guys. Oh boy. For real this time. Time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got the timer ready. So let's, let's find out how quick it'll be. Oh God. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> So Jane Eyre is the story of a girl who can't go on a walk and she's upset about that. And then her childhood gets worse from there. Um, then after her sad, sad childhood, she starts working as a teacher at the school that she went to, um, that she gets bored with that whole situation. So she gets a new job as a governess where she goes to a place called Thornfield Hall and she starts teaching a little French girl, but she gets bored there again. And she goes for a walk in the woods and a man runs her down on a horse, but it's her fault for sure. And... <laughs> Then she finds out later that's her boss and he's actually kind of hot in like a like angsty teen boy sort of way. And she wants to kiss him and stuff. And he tries to make her jealous with this other lady, but he ends up proposing to her. And then at their wedding, it turns out he already has a wife locked in the attic, which is shocking brand new news. And so she leaves and goes hang out with somebody I hate. And then after a while with a guy that I hate so much, she hears his voice on the wind and goes back to the original boss boy and she kisses him and they fall in love and they get married a minute and seven seconds oh it's the shortest one i've done in a while i'm, I'm and impressed. it was bad i'm impressed <laughs> You, Thank you you made me worried when you started with details such as no chance for a walk and I was like oh no like that's a very specific plot point. I watched your eyes get so big <laughs> I was like I promise it's just because that's like a thing yeah. I'm not gonna go into all the details right her childhood was sad that's all you need to know exactly OG uh sad boss or however you referred to him that was great <laughs> I think that should be like uh oh no you said OG boss boy boss boy 
Yeah. I, I think- like calling men boss boys because boss girl is a thing that has started to truly upset me. Mm-hmm. And when I say boss boy, people understand why. Oh yeah, totally. No, it's uh, it's kind of at least a yucky taste in your mouth. So, mm-hmm. but <laughs> Rochester's a bo- boy boss yeah. for sure. Sweet. No, I'd, I'd say so. Top level thoughts and opinions. I, uh, ooh, oh, you go. Okay. If I may. <laughs> I loved this. Um, oh, good. This, I think, is going to be in, like, my top five, at least, nice. of, like, favorite nice. adaptations. And a big part of it came down to the fact that I am just obsessed with these voice actors, mm-hmm. which are full-time actors. We're going to talk a lot about them coming up here. But, boy, oh, boy, did I love Amanda Hale's voice as Jane. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though she came across as very, like, a lot older than 18, I don't care. I would much rather hear this kind of, like, solemn like beautiful, intense, in, like in, introspective voice, which I feel like matches Jane. And then, woof, holy hell, Tom Burke, you can talk to me anytime. Like that was just like so good. And I kept thinking like, what if when this was on the radio, you know, you're just going out, you're in England. You're like, I'm going to run to the store and pick up some bread. And you turn on the radio and you let's like, what's on BBC? And you hear this guy saying some of this very intense romantic shit. And I'd be like, what the hell is this? They allowed to play this on, on national radio? What's going on here? She'd be a little just starts doing the like fanning herself thing in the car because it's far too sexy for her. It's like, holy, holy hell. And then and then I didn't even go to the store for my bread. I just sat in the car for two hours. <laughs> you go back in. You're still with Sam in this hypothetical. Yeah. Uh-huh. And Sam's just like, what? Where have you been? Where's the bread? <laughs> and I'm like, I've been <laughs> trying to keep dinner warm. And we need the bread. <laughs> What's bread again? <laughs> what bread? That thing that Helen gave Jane? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have to tell you about this thing I heard on the radio. I <laughs> <laughs> was like, I'm hungry. Like, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> and I'm in it. <laughs> I'm going to leave you for Tom Hale if you're not good to me. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Lillian, how about some of your thoughts? <laughs> I didn't think about leaving my non-existent partner for Tom Hale, but I did like him. Nice. Um, and I really enjoyed, I felt similarly to you where I don't think the Jane's voice didn't like sound young. Like we've talked about the fact that some of the radio, particularly like the early ones, like the ones we, the thirties one we listened to and the fifties one, like their voices sounded really young. Mm -hmm. And I think what that really is, it's just like, they make their voices sound higher. Yeah. And I, I feel like Jane would have a little bit of a deeper voice. So I think it works for me. We talked about that when we were talking about the Yavapai production, at least that was the one that I made where I was like, I really like how like low her voice is. Um, yeah. that just is now how I'm always going to picture a Jane is like just yeah. kind of a more like lower voiced person. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it makes the moments where she's sort of speaking with that authority mm-hmm. um, and like saying the bird line and stuff, <laughs> just a little more intense, which I enjoyed. Um, I also thought it was really, I liked the way they balanced the narration with the dialogue and the more like in the moment, out of the moment. I loved the music Mm -hmm. choices that they made. I thought it was really atmospheric in a way I enjoyed, but all in all, yeah, I really liked it. I think it was, there was a couple similar to what we talked about last week with the manga. Um, There was a couple specific instances where I was like, um, you guys (laughs) did these two words different and I have (laughs) feelings about it. Um, it's called an adaptation, Lily, and it doesn't have to be word for word. <laughs> but I realized like, what I realized while I was listening to this is it's sort of like if somebody was doing a cover of your favorite song mm. and they messed up some of the lines and or like they just mixed up some of the lyrics and it's because that's the way they prefer to sing it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't disagree with you that that's fine, <laughs> but it just sounds wrong to me. <laughs> I think we might be uh, heading down a dangerous path after like what? like 80 adaptations and having read the book we're starting to get a little too like um usually there's like a pause in between this word and that word and they didn't pause they just went straight through it and i don't know how i feel about that (laughs) i I, by we you of course just mean me because you're sitting here being like i don't know i like when it's different because we've done this so many times and i on the other hand i'm like um he said the string line just like a tiny bit different which is for real one of my notes (laughs) oh my gosh amazing I mean, that is one of your favorite lines. So It is. That's what I mean by the like, it, that's what registered for me this time was mm-hmm. that the it's not even like some lines, it made sense to me. It felt a little bit like 
if you've seen things where they try to make Shakespeare a little bit more accessible by pulling back on some of that yeah. old fashioned language or some of the like wordplay that you're not going to get unless you are sitting down researching it. Mm-hmm. This had some moments like that where they mm-hmm. made slight changes. That's probably more how people talk now, um, but loses a tiny bit of the poetry and the rhythm of some of Jane Eyre. Yeah. Totally get that. But otherwise, I really liked it. Like, that's probably my biggest slash only criticism. Awesome. That and how much time they spent with Sinjin. Yeah. I mean, this was a version that was very true to the original story. It included pretty much all of the major elements and a lot of the minor elements. Um, Mm -hmm. So they didn't, like, skip over the childhood and they didn't skip over the Sinjin parts, which... With Sinjin, especially because I was like a little behind on listening to this, I literally finished it and then I came down and jumped to the studio. <laughs> um, so I did do a little skipping in the Sinjin parts. But it made me think a bit about an episode or an adaptation that really sits in the childhood moments. I mm. think what is significant about that and what we lose when we have shorter versions that just are like, we want to focus on the romance, not necessarily mm-hmm. the context. That is such an important part of understanding Jane, her journey, how she makes these decisions in her life. And so I think it is refreshing now and then, even if it takes longer Mm -hmm. to go back and have that context given to us. For sure. And I think I feel the same way about the Sinjin stuff. Like I get annoyed with it because we have to watch it so many times. Mm -hmm. And with the Rochester parts and with even with the childhood parts now there's moments that I really like and so I'm like waiting for those moments Mm -hmm. um where I just hate Sinjin so much (laughs) yep that it's it's a little bit more like knowing there's a clown under your bed that wants to murder you oh my god like that's a little (laughs) bit more like that for me amazing but I think that it is so the more that I understand this story and after reading the book my understanding of the function of that time mm-hmm. that she has with Sinjin mm-hmm. is so important. Yeah. Um, and I think they, what I will give them credit for in this is they did a really good job of sitting in Jane's self-reflection for that yeah. and getting a lot of her personal growth for that part, which a lot of, I mean, it's obviously easier to do when you're leaning so much on narration versus mm-hmm. the movies and things like that. Like that's really hard to portray Right. that she's growing as a person and that's the point of what's happening here. Right. Exactly. But then he says things like, you're made for labor, not love. And then I have to jump into the past um, and <laughs> and into fiction and do a murder. <laughs> I also, it stood out to me because I did catch this part when they're doing the whole prey scene, which is easily my least favorite thing that happens in this. And they had the thing where his hand is on her head. And then like, she's like, oh yeah. And then he like pushed down harder at one point. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> Like, I'm going to snap off your fingers. Stop touching this lady. And that's the thing that is like so good. About, like that's the thing that's so good about Jane Eyre and so good about a good adaption is it makes you feel such strong feelings. Mm-hmm. And so like you did it good. Yeah, no. And the other thing that I have to remind myself, like I said, maybe there's a scenario where someone got in their car to go get a loaf of bread and they turn on BBC radio and this <laughs> is their first time hearing it. So for us who have listened to the 80 some versions, we're like, we're over it. Skip it's that part. Close to 80, but yes. Um, sure. But so like, you know, other people need that. Like yeah. they haven't, this isn't for the, the weirdos like us who like binge obsessively watch like and consume all Jane Eyre content. This isn't, this isn't weird. This isn't a weird thing that we do. This isn't a thing that we started as a joke and then all of you lovely people came here and now we listen to it all the time and it's a really big part of our lives. Exactly. No, no way. <laughs> Um, totally normal. There's I what I do think is some interesting context about this adaption is it was originally so we listened to it on a definitely definitely not stolen YouTube version. Thank you YouTube person for uploading it so we could listen. And it came out to just shy of just shy of 215. So it it was a little bit shorter than that, but they were as 10, 15 minute episodes mm-hmm. was the original release of this. Um, and the reason that it came out the year that it did is it was in honor of Charlotte Bronte's 200th birthday. Oh, that's cool. So that's why it came out that year. The BBC did a whole thing about it. Nice. Well, they yeah. did a really good job. That's a wonderful version to dedicate to the author. Yeah. What so year was well this done. again? Do you remember? This was 2016. Okay. Cool. Um, and the, I believe I ha- I'll have to actually check this for sure, but I'm fairly certain this was the 
first adaption that the, that the BBC specifically had done since the 1994 one we listened with Syrian Hines. Okay. So there was other adaptations that were radio ones mm-hmm. between then, but I think this was the one that the BBC did. And this is, speaking of the Syrian Hines one, that one I want to say was like four hours. Mm-hmm. This, so this was about half as long. Yeah. Um, and Thank our God. other ones, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think they did a really, really like huge props to her name is uh, Rachel Joyce, mm-hmm. and she is an author and has written many radio plays in the past and has won many awards for it. So I think they really brought out kind of the big guns for this and made a really good adaption yeah. um, to sort of celebrate that. Absolutely. So should we talk a little bit about this cast before we dive into some details about this adaptation? Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the cast. Okay. Uh, Jane or Rochester first? Let's start with Jane because she's the only one I have facts about. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> what do you have facts about Amanda Hale? She was in two shows that I recognized. Um, one was a movie, a little little franchise called Star Wars, mm-hmm. where she played a captain lady, and she was very fancy, and I looked at the pictures, and she spooked me a little bit. Oh my very gosh. different from Jane. <laughs> um, playing a little space Nazi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little space Nazi. <laughs> and then the other thing that I recognized her from, or that I found a bunch of pictures from her from, um, mm-hmm. is called Ripper Street. Did you okay. ever watch that? Nope. Um, so it's this period drama that's essentially, my understanding of it is it's about like finding Jack the Ripper. Okay. Um, and she plays like one of like a nurse or something similar to that, or a lady in an incredibly fancy dress Fair is nice. all that I know for sure. <laughs> I am, I know her from, uh, I think it's called the white queen. Uh, oh, yep. cool. Uh, mini series from stars, uh, from 2013, I was watching most of that last summer nice. while I was house sitting for my parents because they have stars and I do not. <gasps> so I was like, I got to eat up all these star shows while I'm here. <laughs> uh, and I don't remember her very much from that, that show, but it was a very pretty show. So nice. yeah, cool. That's what I know her from. Um, I like, by the way, just quick tangent, um, the fact that you referred to uh, her job as a space Nazi in Star Wars. It's one thing, I don't know if I've talked to you about this, but it's one thing that keeps feeling odd to me whenever I see like video of people who are at uh, the edge of the universe or whatever it's called at Universal or no Disney. And they're like doing shows where they like parade out the literal space fascists. And everyone's like, yay, as if it's the changing of the guard. I'm like, this is so bizarre. Like, you know, these guys are bad guys, right? And the little kids are there with their parents, like waving at the stormtroopers. It's just an odd feeling. (laughs) Yeah, it's yeah, it's that is a that is one of those things where I'm like, we understand that we probably shouldn't be like, we're walking a weird line when we cosplay as fictional Nazis. Like, <laughs> we get that, right? You've got to be very clear that this is not the side you're actually on and that you know you're playing the villain. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, I understand, like, being at a convention and someone dressing as a stormtrooper because it's like, you know, it's a fun, recognizable yeah. character. Like, that's like, you can just do that however you want to. It's just like, I don't know, there's something about the big show that they put on at Disney where I'm like, Ooh, and also this is owned by a like billionaire mouse who owns all the (laughs) other things that we consume. For sure. (laughs) Mickey Mouse is the owner of Disney. In case you were wondering, Mickey Mouse owns that. You don't Um, mess with the mouse, Lillian. That's what they always say. (laughs) Incredible. So anyway, back to Jane Eyre. (laughs) If the mouse is listening, please don't be mad. We meant it with love. Yeah, um, you can come on the podcast, Mr. Mouse. It's okay. (laughs) Mr. Mouse, we'd love you to be here. Please don't come after us. (laughs) So anything else about... Oh, you had your facts. Tell us your Amanda Hale facts. That was my Amanda Hale facts, but Oh, cool. cool. Two things that she's in. Fun facts. (laughs) (laughs) She's in things. That's a fact. Our other radio actresses we had no facts about. Okay. They just were women who were one time on TV and then a lot of times on the radio. There you go. So this is more fun. They had voices and the ability to read scripts. So Mm -hmm. fun fact. Which I do too if anybody wants me to play Jane. Hey. Lillian, do your best, uh, like read of a, uh, your favorite Jane airline real quick for the people listening. Oh God, that's terrible. What a terrible position to put me in. Mm -hmm. Um, Reader, I married him. 
You got the job. Well done, Thank Lillian. You. I'm going to tell everyone else to leave that we don't want them. You're you're the one for this. Well done. Thanks. Oh my god. You're welcome. I'm honored. <laughs> Do you want to be my Rochester? <laughs> yes, Jane. I will be your Rochester. <laughs> It was so good so fast. <laughs> so speaking of that, let's talk about Tom Burke, who voiced our Rochester in this. Yes. So not only do I know him from also a couple of shows and movies, but this is my favorite Tom Burke fun fact that I identified by just browsing through his filmography on IMDb. Nice. So he was in the movie Mank, which we've talked about on the show before. And guess who he played, Lillian? I don't know. He played Orson Welles in the movie Mank, and Orson Welles played Rochester. Oh my god! <laughs> so it's all coming full circle, baby. It's all the same thing. <laughs> Three degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you know everyone knows everyone. Amazing. Dude, we should or start a conspiracy theory. Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I don't think it's three degrees. I think that's too close. <laughs> yeah, I think it's six or something. <laughs> But yeah, guys, if you want to help us start uh, spreading uh, a big conspiracy theory online that everything is somehow connected to Jane Eyre, uh, we'll send you oh our God. secret email. Honestly, we, can get we this could. Going. Yeah. It's not a secret email. You just email the airbuds at gmail.com email account. That too. And that's where we collect all of the information. So far, the government has yet to catch on, um, although mm -hmm. I'm certain they will. Yeah. No, you just have to disguise uh, the email just in the subject line, put taxes, colon, and then that. No one looks at taxes stuff yeah yeah not the ira um, especially <laughs> that, IRS. that would be fine the, the IRS. ira is a very different oh thing. is it the rifle association <laughs> no it's not that's the nra which is again a third different thing what's the ira was the irish like freedom group during oh. the civil war there <laughs> That did a lot of like, <laughs> were they a freedom group or were they terrorists? We don't know. And that is something we are oh not taking a side on on this podcast. That's so funny. But we are very pro the existence of the IRS, but they I'm also very afraid of them. Taxes make me so nervous. That's why people don't look into taxes things unless they are the IRS, <laughs> IRA or NRA. <laughs> Because the IRA and the NRA are constantly up in Piper's taxes. Oh, obviously. They're like, we got to see what these taxes are about, man. I just got a bad feeling about it. So anyway, if you want to help us with this conspiracy, you know where to get us. Oh, my God. <laughs> what Tom Burke things do you have to share, if any? Nothing. <laughs> I'll just say he was also in a TV show of the Three Musketeers, which I started watching. Didn't get all the way through, but I want to go back to... Uh, it had a bunch of actors in it that I like, including Peter Capaldi, which is the reason why I started Fun. watching that in the first place. He plays a corrupt cardinal, uh, which apparently he's not going to do the exact same role when he's going to be Frollo in the live action remake of uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Nice. So that'll be interesting. I mostly think of Peter Capaldi as the doctor and or I'm wrong about who Peter Capaldi is. You are correct. That is. Okay, he's the, the silver haired doctor. Nice. Yes. Um, and I just know that he was a huge Doctor Who fan, and you could tell that in his portrayal. <laughs> when he was a child, he had a Doctor Who fan letter <laughs> that Cute. he would send out, and then he became the Doctor. That's and it makes me so happy. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> um, no surprise, I have a little like old man crush on him, and so <laughs> his like episodes are the only like Doctor Who episodes that I've ever sought out. Um, nice. And I love that he plays guitar. He's a cool guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. He's the doctor, but he's cool. <laughs> and old. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other cast members you want to talk about? I have all their names here, but that's not super interesting. Um, I just think there was, they did have a much bigger cast than most of the radio adaptions that we've watched. There were over 10 people in this. Um, they had a pretty, pretty widespread cast, including a separate actress who played Jane as a child, which I enjoyed because Same. while you can put on a child voice, it's not super fun to listen to. Nah, nah. They made and the I right liked, decision there. And I really liked the way you had mentioned a parallel to um, the musical um, and seeing that. And the parallel that I found in this was I really enjoyed the way 
they did the childhood with adult Jane as the narrator. Mm-hmm. Um, because it that is something that you sort of feel in the book, that it's simultaneously the experience of this child and also the reflections of an adult on their own childhood. Mm-hmm. And you kind of get that, this almost like Jane watching and observing herself and yeah. the past. Absolutely. Now, <laughs> there is so much about this like narrative approach um, that I really appreciated because it did kind of feel almost like listening to an audiobook version mm-hmm. of Jane Eyre, uh, which I don't think that should really count as an upcoming adaption because we've already read it. So it wouldn't, the only real difference would just be how, kind of how the narrator does different inflections. But I just think that's kind of interesting to think about that this was sort of like a more elaborate, like audiobook reading kind of. Yeah, almost. I think they, they did a really good job of trimming it down in such a way that it felt like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the audiobooks that I've looked at take about 10 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to give people an idea of like how well they turned that down. And I think a lot of that was in the way they used, um, want to say foliage and I know it's wrong. We just talked about it. Foley work, I think. Foley work to sort of create this world and have you experience it without, through that sound versus Mm -hmm. through a description, which I thought was really interesting and well done. Yeah. I think to reflect real quick on some of the vocal performances. So this is easily my favorite radio adaption that we've listened to. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm even putting it up there with like some of my all time favorite like movie adaptations. But I think one thing that really stood out to me is for me anyway, you can tell, I think that these actors are not just like voice actors, but are used to like, you know, interacting like on a, in a live setting with other people, because it really, there were so many moments where you felt as if they were actually kind of like walking and talking in those sort of like Mm -hmm. scenes where like they're in the garden or they're doing things like that. And there were a few moments and this was also, I think just like great audio editing and effects, but like when Jane leaves the party and he goes after her, like Mm -hmm. they did a really good job of him kind of like sounding far away. And then you like hear him approach her and there was just so much, I don't know. There's so much like, I can't even say it. I'm not the one who's good at talking right now, but they did a wonderful job of making it feel as if you were watching a movie with the screen off. Yeah. It was like, there was a, like that change in perspective and distance at different points where like we had sort of a fixed point. Cause at one point Jane starts to sound further away as she starts to kind of walk away from him. Mm -hmm. But that, that again, like, that's exactly what I mean by like, in the, if it was truly like an audio book, there would be a description of like, then I took a few steps away or he came out to me in the hallway or whatever it is. And they didn't do that to that level of detail. Instead, they played with this, like the distance that the voices sound and things like that in a way that just like tells you because that's how you process that information, that that's what's happening. And it was really subtle and very well done. And Mm -hmm. that's why I think this is one of the shorter one uh, adaptions, like again, movies, at TV shows, other any of the other formats we've watched it in, that feels really complete. Yeah. And yet is only two hours and 10 minutes. Yeah. Which I know sounds long for a radio show, mm-hmm. but is short for Jane Eyre. No, it's great. I would also, we were saying about uh, the manga of like, that's a great way to mm-hmm. introduce someone who likes manga to Jane Eyre. I feel like this is a very digestible way to introduce also someone who doesn't know anything about Jane Eyre to be like, hey, you can treat this like a podcast. Just listen to it while you're mm-hmm. on your way to work or whatever. Because yeah, yeah, it's very true to the story. Beautiful line delivery. Uh, I love the way that especially like Tom Burke and Amanda Hale interpreted just the emotion of a lot of these pivotal scenes. I thought the like the burning bed scene, the way that they talk with one another before she like leaves that was just so beautifully done to convey so much with the voice alone. And Mm -hmm. I think it obviously helps that we've seen so many versions, but I feel like you wouldn't need to have seen a single version to like see what they're doing, how they're looking at each other and how they feel in that moment. There's, yeah, he had this like gentleness, um, but also like his voice was very low and intense and it, he didn't do any of the kind of like temperamental screamy stuff I thought mm-hmm. he seemed very level-headed, but at the same time, because we always talk about, you know, one thing about Rochester is that he does have sort of this this temper or this kind of like darkness to him. And I think the way that Tom Burke did this was more kind of focusing on this is a man who is like just dealing with a lot of emotional mm-hmm. kind of trauma and guilt. And that kind of comes through in like the darkness of his line delivery 
when he's like, I'm trying to seek happiness and I know what I'm doing is wrong, but yeah. I just have these feelings for you. And I think to hell with it. I'm just, I'm going to go for that. I, I'm just going to see what happens, I guess. And so I liked that a lot. Yeah. And I think along those same lines, they did a really good job of balancing that thing that is sort of always true of Rochester. That gets sometimes interpreted in a way that I feel is like a misinterpreted way of that, like anger or like other things, the, the references to like the changeability that he has. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is him. The way that I would describe it now is like processing trauma. Mm -hmm. And so he's kind of always being drawn back into these memories, back into this past and this high, highly aware of the fact that of how Bertha is affecting his life. And you hear that in the scene when he's describing Celine and they're walking and talking about her and they're having this conversation and Rochester in the book sort of takes this left turn and starts telling this story in a way that is like very confusing Mm -hmm. if you don't have the context we do. And they did that really well where like he forgot what he was talking about and just started talking about other stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And then Jane's like, so you were saying, Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and he's what? like, oh, that's right. <laughs> it's like, um, you had this really interesting story. Uh, some come on, bring on that juicy goss. <laughs> hot hot goss, please. Thank you. That was one thing that stood out to me uh in listening to this version is because I feel like I don't know about you, but for me, when like, you know, consuming the story again and again and again, a lot of the sort of like shocking points can become dulled just by familiarity. Mm-hmm. And I think the one thing that stood out to me is how unusual it is that he is telling this to Jane, like while they were walking, you know, in the garden, confessing that he essentially Mm -hmm. had this romantic affair. Uh, And I I think part of why that stood out is because they included the line, you know, where he has this kind of moment of reflection of being like, how odd is it that I'm deciding to, you know, tell these things to you, my Mm -hmm. 18 year old uh, governess that is my employee. That's very strange. But I guess that says something about how I feel about you because I'm being very open right now. And that feels vulnerable Mm -hmm. at the same time. And so we instantly we go from like, that is weird to oh, that's nice and all this stuff. So and then too, I think when there's the scene where they take Mason away, and they're Mm -hmm. having that moment that kind of heart to heart in the garden. And he goes in to kind of start to tell his story of like, Mm -hmm. when I was 21 I was set on this wrong path like not a crime mind you but an error like an error or whatever Mm -hmm. and he talks about he like says very directly to her it's like what if you know you wanted to pursue like blind passion like would that be so wrong and I'm like dude that is also like a big thing to say to your 18 year old employee Mm -hmm. you're talking about like going after what I mean, you could fill in the blanks with whatever you think he's saying, but it's kind of obvious there. And so those moments were standing out to me. And I thought that was refreshing because I thought they delivered yeah. them well. And I think that that's where those slight differences that I was talking about in the wording, I think that's what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Like they were they were calling out. They're like, we're you're taking this story that should take 10 hours to tell. Mm-hmm. And you have to tell it in two hours and you want to stay true to the book while also calling out some of these things. And I think they did a really good job. Sometimes when they take subtext and they turn it into text to save time, Mm -hmm. they ruin it Mm -hmm. because it's not subtle and it's annoying to me. Right. And I think they did a really good job of doing that in several different moments where they just said, it's kind of weird that I'm telling this to my governess. Mm -hmm. And Rochester always sort of muses on that, but the way he does it is so windy Mm -hmm. that you don't always catch it. And Mm -hmm. I think just having it be a little bit more explicit like that is just makes it easier to follow the story um, and makes it that little bit more accessible that we talked about. Um, It's sort of like the, another line around the Mason thing is instead of saying, do you faint at the sight of blood? He says, do you not like the sight of blood? Like, are you afraid of the sight of blood? And she doesn't say anything about it thrilling her. I'm mm-hmm. like, rude. <laughs> Lillian's like, come on. I like, that's one of the most interesting characteristics about Jane. She's it's, into it. <laughs> it's just one of, it's one of the things that I will never get over. Because it was, it was like a thing I was waiting to read the book to see why Jane never says anything about it. Mm-hmm. And then you find out it's weirder than you thought. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Hey, their weirdness compliments each other. So yes, it works out. Um, I also enjoyed, they did a little bit of an illusion earlier when they're having the fireside chat Mm -hmm. and they're talking about the paid subordinate thing and they're having that whole conversation. And she pulls in a line from 
the later money matters part where she says, you actually haven't paid me and you owe me. Mm-hmm. And then when they get to the money part, he's the one who says back to her, I owe you, yeah. which I think is fun. No, that was all done really well. And also they added something to the money scene that I just found fabulous. So when Jane and Rochester are like doing their cute little flirty money banter, normally in the novel or in the movie or wherever, it's like ex- Explained that he takes her into the side room and kind of like leans against the door to give them privacy. Mm-hmm. That obviously didn't happen here because the whole time Blanche is in the background being like, Edward, uh, hey, Edward, <laughs> hey, hey, are you done talking to her yet? We're playing billiards, Edward, and, like just keeps like chiming in. And I just imagine him being like, oh my God, give me five minutes. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was fun. He's like, I have never liked you and I will never like you. He's like, you're literally here just to make this girl pay attention to me. And she's paying attention to me now. So you could go away. Goodbye. (laughs) As soon as she leaves for whatever this is, you are all leaving because your purpose is served. (laughs) Seriously. Um, Yeah, no, I thought they did a great job with like, I think moments like that too. That's another thing that I feel like we've talked about more recently Mm -hmm. um, a lot, which is that humor in Jane Eyre and how a lot of the adaptations, they lean so hard hard into the drama and the gothic part of it that they miss the humor that's so important for the romance yeah um and so they deliver a lot of lines with that like subtle laughter in their voice Mm -hmm. that a lot of adaptions don't in a way that makes those lines a lot funnier yeah because there are lines where either he's an asshole or he's making a joke right and it all depends on how it's delivered yeah Mm -hmm. i thought this was a rochester who would be easy to fall in love with i would forgive him again can't say whether i would stay or not but i'd be like yeah no i totally get it like this really sucks other mistresses so yes he did do that um but i don't know there was something about just the way that he talked in his voice and the way that he reasoned things so i had i wanted to ask you this question lillian so for you when you are like when you see a character that you find attractive And this has to, Mm -hmm. I guess, only work within like movies, shows and like radio or audio formats. Mm -hmm. How significant is the way that their voice, uh, how how significant is it to you, um, the way that their voice sounds to like sway you one way or the other? So like there are five, but their voice is a 10. What does that equal for you? Kind of a thing. (laughs) Um, you know, I honestly don't know. Okay. Um, I think, I think for me, it's more of, it's less of a, like, it's more like if their voice is really annoying, Mm -hmm. then it can't handle that. Take them down points. Then their voice being really good. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, but. Because I know for me, from my experience, and I think a big part of this comes from just my love for like animated things. And Mm -hmm. so I love a very dramatic, like an a very dramatic voice that you would get in kind of like an animated feature. And we've talked, we've been over this before. It's like, it's old hat now that I like villains and and spooky guys and all this stuff. And famously love a potato face. Right. Um, So for me, my answer to the, my question that I posed to you, which I guess I posed so I could answer it myself, (laughs) but (laughs) is that for me, if someone's like a five, but their voice is a 10, then that definitely raises them up a bunch of notches. Cause I'm like, dude, Like, you can look weird, but if you talk to me like that, that's great. So voices, that's a big thing for me. I love a a good voice. Perfect. I love that too. (laughs) What did you think of the proposal scene? Loved it. Absolutely loved it. I feel like, I don't know. I'm I'm struggling to pinpoint specific things to talk about without just repeating myself of just how in love I was with their delivery and their inflection and the level of passion. Um, I thought this was a very gentle uh, proposal mm-hmm. scene from him because we've often talked about how you know the teasing can be too mean or can go too mm-hmm. far and I think this one definitely came across to me I think is the way that it was intended where it's sort yeah. of this is just his final sort of little nudge to try to get her to admit some feelings so that he can then mm-hmm. you know confess everything to her as well so I thought that was done very well it didn't feel harsh I loved her emotion right from the start which mm-hmm. I think was very important is her being right away 
like the way they set up that scene, she went to the garden to just kind of be alone, sort mm-hmm. of like, like, okay, I got to collect myself. Shit, my crush is here. Now he's mm-hmm. asking me all these questions. Dude, I came here to cry because I love you. It's like, oh shit, I said it out loud. It's like, yes, <laughs> let's get married and gotcha. stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I think she did, that's the other thing too, where it's like, I don't know that I w- would have picked up on the emotions in someone's voice. That's the, one of the things I love about getting to see this in all of these different adaptions. It's like the exact opposite of the ballet, right? Where mm-hmm. you see all of the emotion in the movement, um, where this you see, you hear all of the emotion in her voice and you can hear him like almost putting on this casual facade mm-hmm. of like, great news. I got you a job. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's in Ireland and she just immediately gets so emotional and it's interesting listening to him get softer as her voice gets more emotional. Yeah. And then he comes in and does that like big save. And, um, but that is, it's also one of the scenes that I noticed the most of those like subtle changes to lines mm-hmm. that that scene to me is like my favorite song. And I need those lines to be exactly right. And it, it genuinely, it's the same thing. Yeah. But the line, specifically the string line, Mm -hmm. he says, um, take to bleeding inside instead of take to bleeding inwardly. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, the rhythm of that is different. The meaning of it is the same, Mm -hmm. but the rhythm of that is different in a way that bothers me. And some of the lines she delivers are the same. They do the cage, the bird in the cage line, exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But there's other ones that just like, they're just a little off. (laughs) Totally fair. And then when that is sort of like one of the big peak moments, I can totally understand. And I think it's justified to say like, I want this like this way kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing I thought they did really well with that scene is when she like attempts to kind of like run away and he sort of grabs her and then he Mm -hmm. has the delivery that to kind of set her up of like, don't struggle. So like a bird in a Mm -hmm. net or whatever. And then she Mm -hmm. says her line. And I thought that was another thing where like, Again, there's no narrator popping in that says, I ran away from him and he grabbed me. Mm -hmm. Like, you can hear it. You can hear what's happening. And they put the struggle into their voices and it was all there and it was so good. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that that's, it's the same thing. It's one of the things that's so unique about Jane Eyre as a book as well is like, we've talked about how so many of those scenes that are so classic are so ripe for adaption because so much of it sits in Rochester's dialogue, Mm -hmm. which is so interesting. Yeah. Um, like that scene in the book, she may say that she starts to walk away, but most of the description of the actions of the scene of like what people are doing in the scene and Jane's emotion is in Rochester's description of it, mm-hmm. which is very, very interesting to me it um, is. and makes this kind of adaption really really interesting. So I know this is in the book that he, that there's like a big storm that night and he comes to her room to check on her and they do that narration. But then we get to actually hear him knock on her door and be like, Hey Jane, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, yes I am. And she giggles a little bit and he goes, okay, good. Cause good, nicely good. (laughs) And I just can see him being like, I have this happiness. Like it's the same instinct that makes him say to the heavens Mm -hmm. I have her god forgive me I'm keeping her like that Mm -hmm. same instinct is captured in this knocking on the door moment of like he knows this situation is so fragile and he's so aware of it yeah he's so afraid that something is going to happen to take that away from him yeah and it so the storm happens and he needs to know that she's okay and you can just see him in his bedroom being like that was a really loud thunder. I got to go check on Jane. Oh my God, <laughs> cute. Yes. No, I love that read of that scene. That's so good. I have to just throw out here, just in case any of our listeners also have an interest in this obscure show that I'm obsessed with, because what you were just talking about with that scene makes me think of a show that I love, The Ghost in Mrs. Muir, uh, the adaptation for the television. Like there's also the movie, but there's the show. Uh, and it's like, I think the second episode of that, which is like, it's literally about like, a a widow and her two cute kids and they move to this cool spooky old house and there's a ghost of a sea captain there and he's all like boo get out of my house and she's like no bitch i bought it i'm staying and he's like "Hmm, maybe i'll romance you and she's like rad put your money where your mouth is and it's great um but so like the second episode there's like a engaged couple that their car breaks down and they have to stay the night there but it's the 60s so they're like we can't sleep in the same bedroom until we're married and the guy's trying to be all macho but the ghost is spooking him so he keeps going to his 
fiance's door and he's like what if what if i just slept on the floor though and she's like thinking that he's trying to come in and like make a move and she's like no dude like we're getting married tomorrow you can wait and he's like no but i'm actually scared <laughs> <laughs> okay that is reminiscent of a story that happened to me in life oh when i was in college there was this guy i worked so i worked in catering and often our shifts would like we weren't technically allowed to be scheduled past 10 p.m. But often they would just schedule us till 10 and we wouldn't get to leave until like 11, 1130. Mm-hmm. And I went to school in a very safe, relatively small city, Moorhead, Minnesota. And it was a college campus that was super well lit at night. Like I, it didn't occur to me at all that somebody could be afraid there. Mm-hmm. And this guy who worked there, we lived in the same dorm and I was working after he was about like 20, 30 minutes before I could clock out. And he clocked out and he goes, Lillian, I'm going to wait for you so that I can walk you home so you can be safe. And I suspected this guy had a crush on me and I absolutely did not feel that way about him. (laughs) So I was sort of mean. Oh no. (laughs) And just like after the fourth time he said he was going to wait for me, I was like, dude, I'm fine. It's 20 feet. Like I am not worried about this just leave. Mm-hmm. And I walked out of the building and he was right inside the front doors. And he said, I'm from a really small town with like 400 people. And this feels like a city to me. And I'm kind of scared to walk across campus by myself. And I'm sorry if you felt like I was pestering you. Aww. And I was like, no, you sweet beat. I will never be mean to you again. <laughs> That's very nice. Mm-hmm. Lillian, you were his Jane that night. I know. <laughs> if only I liked him even a little bit at all. Yeah, if only. <laughs> He's got other ladies walking him home now. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> I think we have misspoken and I was his Rochester that night. (laughs) There you go. There you go. (laughs) Very cute. Incredible. Okay. So, um, oh yes. The thing that I was going to say, uh, this is one of my last notes because a lot of it is all the same old good gushy stuff that we love apart from Mm -hmm. the annoying Sinjin stuff, but uh, got to end on making fun of uh, Dick Mason because I love so much that when he interrupts the wedding and is a big pansy and then Rochester's like, you want to interrupt this wedding? Fine. Let's go interrupt this wedding and see what we're talking about. He's like, oh, I just wanted to interrupt the wedding. I, I didn't want to go see her. And it's like, you don't want to see your sister that you saddled me with, that you left here, that you then went up and got attacked when I told you not to go up there by yourself. <laughs> Bitch. It's like, come up to this room. And he's like, oh, no. And I guess to get up there and he's all afraid. I loved that oh scene. Oh, my God. My last couple of notes um, after that, because I I thought the wedding was really well done. The interruption was really well done. They had Mason do it instead of um, the solicitor, which worked. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were a couple. The the first note that I have after the wedding scene was I went to check. I was like, oh, Jane's running away already. I feel like it's we're not that close to the end. And I went and looked and I was like, I literally looked that there was 40 minutes left and out loud said, oh, no, they're going to do Sinjin. (laughs) (laughs) Of course they're going to do Sinjin. They did all the other details. I knew they were going to, but they gave him so much time. (sighs) Um, There were two lines in the Sinjin section Mm -hmm. um, that were different that I actually think change it, like were true adaptions Mm -hmm. and actually change what was being said. Okay. So one was that Sinjin, when he's trying to convince her to come to India, says, open a school for the women in India, hmm. which dramatically changes the ask. Yeah, totally. Not come because... convert people to Christianity with me. Which like, that's what the schools were doing too. Like, yeah, don't get me wrong. Totally. I get that. Totally. Um, but it's also, he, his plea to her is help the women of India. And I think that is so much more appealing to Jane, even mm-hmm. though that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, that is so much more appealing to Jane than what Sinjin says in the book, which is I will set your task by the hour. Oh. <laughs> Um, I hope our listeners are used to us making barfing sounds whenever we talk about this man. I know. As I get better at them, I feel worse for them. (laughs) Um, And then there was also a line where Jane is like so adamantly not going to marry him where there's not as much conflict inside her where she says, if you made me do this, I will commit suicide. Yeah, I remember hearing that one. I'm like, damn, girl. That's not in the book, honey bun. (laughs) Dude, intense. (laughs) I get the impression that maybe this adapter also hates Hates Sinjin as much as we do. Hell yeah. 
We're here so for he you, t- babe. She simultaneously gave him a more valid argument and made Jane hate it more. Mm-hmm. Nope. So <laughs> good. I Dude. Okay. I, I don't really have any notes on other things. Uh, I loved this. Do you have yeah. any final kind of thoughts? The last thing that I have is just, I think the very last line, they did a good job, um, but I would have done it differently. This is just a note for anybody listening to this who's currently working on a radio adoption. She goes, and so mm. I married him. <laughs> it should have been listener. I married him. <laughs> yeah. Listener. Because it's reader. I married him. Yeah. Easy anyway, peasy. That's all I'm saying. An easy change. Um, the autobiography of Jane Eyre uh, web series, mm-hmm. they nailed it with viewer. I married him. Yeah. So just switch what the format is and then do the, I married him. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine um, Lillian getting a call in 2016 from the past. And they're like, Lillian, we're really struggling with this final line here. What, what should we do? And she's like, I got you listener. I married him. And they're like, Oh, genius. Why didn't we we've think of trying, that? We've been trying to crack this nut for days. Your checks in the mail. <laughs> Uh, ready to give it a rating? Yes. Okay. Um, are you going to make me go first again? No, I usually bully you. I can go first. Okay. Okay. So you can do a little think. Um, I'm going to give this 9.5 out of 10. Wow. I liked it. I really liked this guy's voice. Uh, it did it for me, dude, not to make it weird. Um, but this gets a 9.5 out of 10 Birkenstocks for Tom Burke. Because Birkenstocks are those shoes, right? <laughs> Am I thinking of the right thing? It is those shoes. Yeah. But I was not with you at all. I'm like, why sandals? <laughs> because Tom Burke. And I was like, how can I tie this in? Burke Birkenstocks. So nice. a couple of nice little sandals for me. <laughs> I love it. Thanks. Um, do you want to tell your story about the, how you acquired a pair of Birkenstocks? <laughs> Always. So uh, there is a river. Uh, I think it's in Wisconsin, technically, right? No, it's absolutely not. Oh, it's in Minnesota? Um, it's okay. for sure in Minnesota. Okay. Well, there's a river in Minnesota. It's called the Apple River, and it is has for a long time been a great summer destination for inner tubing. And there is a whole inner tube company where you start at the top of the river, and they give you the tubes, and you float down, and then at the end, you get in the shuttle, and then you get to – they take you back, and then you get to go home. And it's just like hours of lazy river time. You can get drunk and sunburned and have a great joy on the river. It's and so we fun. always recommend drinking responsibly. Yes, drink um, responsibly. That day we did not. We did not. I <laughs> was pretty river drunk and like sunburned and heat like sick. And I was, the river was incredibly low. And I had like slipped kind of halfway out of my inner tube. So I was like, had my chin resting on it. And my tummy is like on the bottom of the river and it's fast. So it's pulling me along and I'm getting scraped up. I'm like, ow, 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 ow. And everyone's like, stand up. I'm like, I can't. <laughs> and I'm just getting beaten up by this lazy river and my shoes float off my feet and I finally get up and I'm all scraped and I'm sunburned and I'm drunk. I'm like, I lost my shoes. And everyone's like, we can't take you anywhere. What's happening? And our good friend Grace was like, I'm going to go up river and see if I can find your shoes. And she disappears for a while. And then she comes back and she doesn't have my shoes, but she did find a matching pair of Birkenstock sandals. And so she gave them to me and they fit. So I kept them. <laughs> and I was like, yay. We left with Piper having a different pair of arguably better shoes oh yes and that was really funny to me mine were like some two dollar flip-flops from target so (laughs) so send me a picture of those birkenstocks and i will use those awesome i think i don't have those specific ones anymore how dare you but i'll send you my shoes that look like birkenstocks (laughs) my knockoffs (laughs) (laughs) my phone noise out sorry about that what is your Um, rating lillian Oh, I, this is one of those classic Jane, um, Airbuds moments where I am raising my rating because of how much fun I had talking about it and Yay. how much you liked it. Aww. So I was at, um, more like a seven or an eight and I'm going up to an 8.5. Very nice. Um, and I'm going to go with Foley work. Ooh, awesome. Yeah. Because I, I learned a word that I'm going to remember. Hooray. I'm, I'm very excited like to see how you're going to do that stuff. graphic. Yeah. <laughs> you put like birds and gravel and stuff and it's not going to make sense to people who didn't listen to this. Hey, no worries. Birds, gravel, and then it's a little microphone. To. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. These um, are inside jokes that people have to listen to the episodes to get. So listeners, if you're here right now, you're in on the joke and we love you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And we don't, it's not that we don't love our Instagram followers who don't listen. Mm -hmm. We do. They're great. But they're not inside our jokes. Seriously. Yeah. Um, So Lillian, what's up for next week? What are we doing? Next week. So uh, just about a year ago, Piper and I had finished watching 10 adaptions of Jane Eyre. And so we decided to do a um, Rochester retrospective was what it ended up being called. We have now watched 35 adaptions of Jane Eyre. 85 adaptions? You count it. 35 adaptions. 2,500 adaptions? A Googleplex? is very impressive. <laughs> Be impressed. I'm impressed. Um, and actually today, speaking of impressive things, today is our 70th episode of Jane Eyre. <gasps> Of earbuds, not of Jane Eyre. We're so old. I'm happy for <laughs> us. And we're aged now. <laughs> um, so that is what we are going to be talking about next week. We're going to do some reflections similarly to what we did last time. We're going to do some best of awards. They will be different from the ones we talked about last time. Um, we are going to do our best to come up with topics that are going to make it different from that last conversation. Because if you want to listen to our thoughts on those first 10 adaptions, we have an episode on each of them. We have rewatches on some of those. And we have uh, the Rochester retrospective we did last year. So we're going to talk a little. This is more of an opportunity to kind of step back, talk about some of the things that we often do in these radio episodes or other things about the way that it gets adapted through different places. Some of the unique things that we find in the fact that we have watched 35 different adaptations of Jane Eyre. Um, 700 billion adaptations. <laughs> <that's good. laughs> Which was one adaptation. <laughs> We're going back in time now. I'm Piper, rewinding the clock. Piper just swings too far one way and ends up back at the beginning. We one time watched one thing of Jane Eyre and it was great. Yeah. And now we have Timothy 70 Dalton, episodes it? about that one viewing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting loopy. <laughs> We're doing great, guys. Um, so we will be talking about all of that next week um, in our Rochester Retrospective 2. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you have thoughts about BBC radio dramas, if you have a story to tell about a time when you went out to get a loaf of bread and then lost track of time because the voices on the radio were so hypnotizing, we want to hear about it. And you can tell us all about it via email. That's right. I'm, I'm switching it up. <gasps> email airbuds at gmail.com or online. You can DM us, comment in the things uh, at airbuds. Comment on an unrelated post. Yeah. Like go back like a month yeah. and comment on a post about a time you got distracted listening to the radio. Seriously. I think that's super funny. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we'll totally forget that we prompted this and we'll just respond and be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Do not provide context. Don't help us out. We immediately, as soon, both Piper and I black out while recording these. And as soon as we leave the recording session, we do not remember we asked for that. We'll be like, ma'am, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> Um, but other reasons to be on our social is that we often put surveys on there. So for example, actively while we are recording this, although if you're listening to this, you did miss it. Oh. Um, we have a survey out there about what book we're going to read next time. We also, um, the week that you are listening to this, are going to be putting out our next palate cleanser survey because after a Rochester retrospective, we will be having another palate cleanser. Um, that is episode is coming out two days before the beginning of the month of March, which here in the U.S. is Pride Month. Bum, bum, bum. So we are going to be watching something super queer. Yay! Um, probably with queer women because I want to watch that. Yay, so, ladies smooching. So we will have four uh, ladies smooching movies, um, mm -hmm. period dramas uh, that you guys can vote on. And... If you're like, well, I have a very strong opinions about which Lady Smoochin movie is the best, mm -hmm. and I would like my vote to count more than other people's votes. Yeah. Two ways you can do that. One is go to every single social channel that we have. It's literally on all of them <laughs> and vote everywhere and comment on everything. Um, and that will help sway it. But for the low, low price of $3, you can join our Patreon and get five times, that's right, five times a regular vote. By having a Patreon vote. And those have swung recent surveys. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it is truly a deal. Um, it's You get to be in charge of what we talk about and what we know and what we watch 
Murely for giving us $3. Yeah. We also have some cool content planned that's coming up, including a full video, including behind the scenes giggles. All the giggles are left in from mm-hmm. our trip to Arizona. We've got uh, musical playlists that we're putting together. And I've got a special kind of like like jazz hour with Piper um, as we break down uh, what songs a moody boy Edward Rochester would listen to. You only get that if you're on the Patreon. We're going to do our special uh, fan fiction episode where we talk about mm-hmm. our experience writing fanfics and then reading each other's fanfics. That's only available on the Patreon. So if you want all that good stuff, just, you know, $3 in change sent in the mail. It's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't send me pennies. <laughs> Send that to Piper's house. You can find her address on the internet. Yikes. (laughs) I'm just going to dox you real quick. No. Um, (laughs) The NRA are listening. (laughs) That and the mouse. Yeah, Um, the mouse. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Uh, So please um, join us next week for another retrospective and more laughs and more silliness and more talking about uh, old-timey gothic romance and everything else that you love because uh, we love yeah. you and we would love we to see love you again you. Yeah, with or without your money yeah. five stars please everywhere hooray so we will see you next time guys and happy Jane Eyre reading watching and listening bye bye bye